well, such that your name will be shown in the Google Classroom. Uh, so I know who you are, okay? And um, I have a flow chart for the learning process. So <clears throat> I want you guys to try to follow this uh, uh, procedure here. So before a lecture, uh, please get the lecture notes ready. So normally I will post lecture notes before each class. So you can print them out and bring them to the lectures. And then also after you print out your lecture notes, you can preview the notes and the corresponding book sections and try to complete the preview homework problems. During a lecture, uh, please stay concentrated on the lecture. Uh, don't use a chat for something irrelevant to this course, okay? And then now and then in the lecture, I will post some poll questions. So please answer those poll questions actively. And if you have questions about uh, uh, what I say in the lecture, uh, you can ask me and I will decide uh, if uh, uh, the question can be answered very quickly, I can answer your question. Or if uh, this question may um, prevent you from following the lecture, I will also address your question. But sometimes I may uh, leave those questions and the other class, okay? So that's uh, uh, my requirement for you during the lecture. After the lecture, uh, please review the lecture and the summary notes in the book sections and complete and turn in homework on time, okay? And we have a recitation for each lecture. So please read the homework solution before the recitation. And then after the recitation, uh, you can correct the homework mistakes. And my lecture is uh, designed to help you understand the material, to understand the fundamentals. So basically we want to address the question, why? And uh, the recitation is focused more on problem solving. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the learning process I suggest for you. Of course, we are not a robots, right? And uh, um, if you can learn this, you can understand the material very well and you can ask, uh, solve the homework problems very well, you don't really have to rigorously follow this uh, um, procedure. Okay, any questions about these uh, general remarks? So if not, without further ado, so let me start today's topics. So this is the first lecture of this calculus course. So first I want to congratulate you on uh, taking this course. And uh, so in today's class, I'm going to address a very important question. What is calculus? And uh, so, this topic is very important because we are going to learn some fundamental ideas for the whole calculus, even though we cannot get into details, but you get uh, the big picture. So what is calculus? Uh, you may say, ah, oh, it's an advanced math subject, right? And uh, so previously you learned some mathematics such as pre-algebra, algebra one, pre-calculus. So normally we regard uh, those courses as uh, elementary math courses. But uh, starting from calculus, we are, we are going to do advanced math. Right? So that's why I congratulate you on that. And the calculus is a subject very important. It is fundamental to STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, okay? Of course, we're not 
satisfied with this answer, right? What is the calculus? Is oh, it's just an advanced math subject. So what really is what really calculus is about, right? So calculus is about instantaneous rate of change, which is called differentiation calculus, and accumulation of a change in quantities, which is called integration calculus. So that's quite a, a mysterious right now, right? What do you mean instantaneous rate of change? What do you mean differentiation, right? What do you mean integration? So to understand what calculus is about, so I'm going to present some fundamental problems. The first problem is the so-called area problem. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, so we all know the area of a rectangle with the two side lenses A and B is given as A times B, right? So using this definition of the area for a rectangle, we can easily find uh, the area of a shape formed by straight lines. For example, suppose I have a parallelogram and you can just cut one corner and put it for another side, then you can derive the area formula for a parallelogram, which is a base length times the height, right? And how about a triangle? And you can make a copy of this triangle and uh, put them together to form a parallelogram. Then we can find the formula for the area of a triangle, right? And similarly, we can find the area of a trapezoid by making another copy of that same trapezoid and put them together to form a parallelogram, right? So those are the formulas. And for a general polygon with multiple sides, you can just cut this polygon into a bunch of triangles. Then just add the areas of all these triangles to find the area of this polygon. Okay, so we are all fine here. Now, how about area of a shape formed by curves? I think a very famous problem is the area of a circle. <clears throat> and we all know the area of a circle with radius r is computed as pi times r squared, right? And this pi is uh, an irrational constant defined as the ratio of uh, a circumference of this circle to its diameter, right? And clearly the circumference L for a circle with radius r would be pi times the diameter, which is 2r, right? Pi times 2r. So that's the circumference. So we have applied this uh, formula, pi r squared, uh, in many situations, right? You know how to compute, right? But if I push you, I ask you why the area of a circle is given by pi r squared. So let me answer this question. Actually, this question was investigated in ancient time, okay? And uh, you will see some idea underlying calculus. So some people claim Newton and Leibniz, they discovered or say they invented the calculus. That's really a very, uh, very, uh, uh, overly simplification, okay? So the calculus, actually uh, many people uh, made a contribution to the ideas uh, underlying calculus, including Archimedes, uh, Fermat, um, and uh, um, Barrow, many people, okay? Of course, Newton and the Leibniz, they made uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, contributions. Okay, so that's why people credit them as the inventor 
of calculus. Now, why the area of a circle is a pi r square? So let's consider an approximation problem. So I want to find the area of this circle here. Let's look at this picture here. Can you guys see my cursor here? That arrow, can you see it? Yes, okay, thank you, Tianxin. So, right, so what I can do here is I can divide this circle into n equal sectors. So in this picture here, I use the eight sectors, right, equal sectors. Then I can approximate this circle by this uh, polygon. In this picture here, it's an octagon, red octagon, eight sides, right, equal sides like that. And we just learned, right, you can divide this, uh, divide this uh, polygon into eight triangles, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the area of this circle can be approximated, okay? I said approximated, not, a, not exact, okay? Can be approximated by the sum of these a the sum of the areas of these eight triangles, eight uh, congruent triangles, right? That can be easily understood. So I can arrange these eight triangles in this manner, right? See, one here, then the second one is a uh, joined with the first one to form this parallelogram, then the third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one, eighth one. So, so if I use eight sectors, I have eight congruent triangles. I can form this a bigger parallelogram. And the area of this parallelogram is an approximation of the area of this uh, circle, right? That's clear. And if I ask you, is my approximation an underestimate or an overestimate of the area of uh, that circle? What's your answer? Anyone? It's less. It's less, right? So it's underestimated. As you can clearly see, right? You didn't cover the whole circle, okay? So now, of, of course, we know the area of a parallelogram is, uh, is uh, the length of the base B times the height H, right? So B times H is an approximation. But I want to find the true area of this circle. So how am I going to do that? This is a very important idea in calculus, the so-called limit process. As you can imagine, right? Look at this picture here. If I use more sectors, so each triangle is getting smaller, but I have more triangles. So then you expect that a polygon approximates the circle better, right? Do you agree? So if I increase the number of sectors, then the area of that parallelogram approximate the area of that circle better. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the limit and let n approach infinity. So I use infinite many triangles, right? So each triangle, of course, now is just like almost like a none, right? Like a, like a line over there, right? So then, of course, so we have better and better approximation as n is getting bigger and bigger. So as n approaches infinity, so we use this notation here, n is right arrow, then infinity. So as n approaches infinity, okay, we regard the area of all these, all these triangles, these infinitely many tiny triangles will be the area of the whole circle. If you can make sense of this argument, okay, congratulations. So you already master the fundamental idea of calculus. Does it make sense to you? Now, let me challenge you. If n approaches infinity, right, I have this picture here, right? So now if I use a lot of triangles, right, together, so then, so then it actually looks all these triangles put together is almost like a circle, right? 
So as n approaches infinity, what do you think this b would approach? What do you think this h would approach? Can you try that? So that's a poll question here. Think about it. Twenty more seconds. I hope I can get a 100% response rate. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, very good. The majority of you chose the answer B, and a few of you chose answer A, but I'm still very happy you choose that answer, okay? Even though he is not quite right, okay? It's just a, a small mistake you made, okay? So the answer is B, the answer is B. Why the answer is B? As you can see, right? So if you use more and more triangles, then as you can clearly say, the base B is just the, the half of the circumference of it. Does it make sense to you? Because you have B on the top and you have B at the bottom in this parallelogram. I think some of you choose A because you neglected that effect. So it's B, plus B, so all these sides put together, right? Somehow approach the circumference. But all these sides now is divided into the top side and the bottom side. In this parallel one, okay? And how about the H? So B is a half of the circumference and the circumference is two pi R. So B approaches pi R. And clearly that H is approaching to what? So this is my H. Right, if in this picture here, so if I draw H, H is the height of a triangle, right? And now if this N approaches infinity, this triangle is getting thinner and thinner. So H approaches R, right? It's almost like the radius. So H approaches R. So then I think that you have that argument. So what's the area of the circle now? Is B times H. As N approaches infinity, B is pi R, H is R, so pi R squared. That's the proof of the error of a circle formula. So in this example here, right, we saw a very important idea in calculus, the limit process, okay? Now, how about the error under the graph of a function? So we can apply that idea, okay, that ancient idea to figure this out, okay? Say, this red curve is the graph of a function y equal f of x. So I want to find the area under this curve and above the x axis between x equals a and x equals b. That's the region here. Okay, so what's the area of this region? So how to do so? Very similar. We divide and we sum. We add, okay? So what I can do here now is I can divide this region by into a lot of strips. For example, I can divide the region into N strips with the same width, right? So in this picture here, I have eight strips. You see that? Then the area of that region, 
right? This region here can be approximated by the areas of these eight strips, right? And uh, we can make this approximation better and better if I use more and more strips. Do you agree? If you just use one strip, that's a bad idea, right? It's just a pure that rectangle hang here. But now in this case, I use eight strips. I think that uh, that uh, this blue region, right? Uh, the regions included by these blue lines approximate that total two region very well, right? In this case, uh, if I use 80, 800, 8,000, 8 million, 8 billion, you can imagine, right? So then the approximation is getting better and better. And again, if you apply the limit process, uh, let n approach infinity, then the approximation approximates, app approaches the area of the region. Okay, you get the true area. So that's my introduction of the so-called area problem. So here is the summary. So when we want to, when we want to find this area, what I did, I divide, right? I divide into small regions and then I add them together. That's called accumulation. And how to make this better and better? So we have an approximation now, right? So the sum is the sum of all these small regions is the approximation of the true result. So to make this approximation better and better, I use the limit process, right? So it's a combination of these two techniques here, divide and sum and the limit process. And this is what integration calculus deals with, okay? Integration calculus is about the so-called area problem. Now let's switch gear to look at a, a different type of problem, which is called the tangent problem, or say the velocity problem. So as I believe some of you um, had the experience of uh, skinny, right? Skin, right? Skin. I like skin. Okay, so this is a slope, right? So it's a curve, right? You can regard it as a graph of a function y equal of f x, right? That's a, so it's a mountain, okay? I should call it a mountain. So this is a green line is like your ski, right? You stand on that green line on a ski, right? You, 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 you ski down, right? From the mountain. So because in this case, this mountain also this function f of x is a curve, right? It's not a street, okay? So you clearly you know the slopes, at different locations on this mountain, or say on at a different points on this curve, can be different. Right? For example, this boy, this boy here, right, is at this location here. You see, his ski is horizontal, right? No, no, that zero slope. And this girl Amy, right, he is at she is at this location P here, right? Now you see, so her ski has an incline nation right has a steepness here right and this ski or say this uh, green line is called a tangent line to this uh, curl at this point okay at that point tangent line. so the slope of this tangent line can be used to describe the slope of this curve right at that point at the p point right for example so the slope at this point P is the slope of this green guy, of this ski here, this green line. And the slope at this point here, where Boyd is standing, right? So then you see the slope is zero in this case, right? So the slope of the tangent line to the curve at a point is the slope of the curve at that point. Or we can say the tangent line has the same direction as that curve at that point. Because this curve is a curve, right? So the direction is changing at a different locations. Or say the steepness, or say the slopes are different at a different locations. However, for a particular point, I can use that tangent line to indicate its slope or say the direction of this line, of this curve, okay? Now the question here is, how to find that tangent line. And mathematically, you say, okay, I give you a function y equal f of s. You, give it, you have that curve. 
But I give a point on that curve that a point of P right here, right? Say P X is equal to Y is equal to three, right? So at this point here, what's the tangent line? At this point, what's the equation for this line? Can you write down an equation for me? So in order to write down an equation for a line, for example, I can use the point slope form. Do I know the point? You tell me, I want to find the tangent line at that point. So the point P is point two three, right? Coordinates are 23. So in order to write down an equation, I may need the slope. So how to find the slope? And we know the slope of this tangent line really is the slope, or say the steepness of this curve right at this point, or say the direction of this curve at this point. So now the question here is, how can I find the slope? So I'm going to answer this question by asking you another question. So suppose I give you a curve, how do we, how do you draw a tangent line to this curve at this point? Okay, let's do that, right? I think you already applied this idea in, in real, in everyday life. In, so in your everyday life, you already actually applied the idea of the limit process, the fundamental idea of calculus without knowing it. So say this is the curve, right? This is that curve, y equal f of x. So I want to draw a tangent line to this curve at a point P. So this blue line, straight line is my ruler, right? I have a ruler, okay? I have a ruler here. Then I just uh, fix this ruler is through this uh, point here, point P here. What I'm going to do in, re in reality, right? In, in, in practice, when you draw that tangent line, you just then you what? You rotate this ruler around this point P. So make, that, make sure the point the ruler is always through that point, but you, you rotate at the other end. So when you do so, you see that in the section of this ruler with this curve, you call that, that point Q. So that point Q now is getting closer and closer to what? To P, do you see that? Right? So when you, you just rotate that ruler, ruler at some point, then you say, oh, that's a tangent line. So when you get to that tangent line, that Q point somehow is uh, on top of P. Is that like on top of P now? Does it make sense to you? So this process is the limit process. So the ruler is rotated about a point P such that that Q point approaches point P. And uh, the, <clears throat> at a particular instant, I have this ruler, or say this line here. And this line is called a second line to this curve, right? Because it's through P and Q and intersect this curve in this manner. And this second line as Q approaches P, then this second line PQ, right? This line, this is a in co in color, right? This second line, as Q getting closer and closer to P, this sign the line, second line approaches what? The tangent line. So what's the slope of the tangent line? Do you know how to find the slope of a second and second line? You know two points, you can find the slope, right? If you know two points, you can find the slope. So then all you need to do is you find the slope of a second line. And then I take the limit and let Q getting closer and closer to P, then that slope approaches the slope of what? Of that tangent line. Does that make sense to you? Any questions so far? Now, okay, of course, we need to know how to find the slope of a signal line, right? You learned in algebra. So a quick question for you. Find the signal line through the points P and Q on the curve Y equals F of X, right? So this is a, the curve. F of X. I have two points on that curve, P and Q. We know their coordinates. Can you write down the equation for this second line? One minute.
10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so most of you chose A. So let's take a look. So how to find the slope of a line through two points? And you need to know the formula, right? So the slope of the line through point P and Q is given by what? By the difference of the Y coordinates of these two points divided by the difference of the X coordinates of this one, right? So it's Y Q minus Y P divided by X Q minus X P. Okay, so that's the formula. Right? Difference of Y divided by difference of X. That's called a slope, right? So you have a line here, you draw here. So this part here is the difference of even two points here, P and Q. So this is the difference of Y. This is the difference of X, right? That ratio gives the slope, right? So if the slope is bigger, that means that, that Y over that X is bigger. So in this problem here, but be careful, okay? It's YQ minus YP, that is XQ minus XP, right? The first, the coordinates of the first point subtract the coordinates of the second point. Don't mess up. You don't write down as a YQ minus YP divided by XP minus XQ, that is wrong, okay? So what is YQ? So look up for your data, right? Q, YQ is 3.5, right? This is a YQ. This is a X, uh, this is a y, y, YP, right? So YQ is 3.5, YP is equal three. And XQ is equal three and XP is equal two. So this can be easily computed as a 0.5, right? So the slope of this second line is 0.5. Then you can use any point, right? Use the point slope form. Right? Point, do I, have, do I have a point? You can use P, you can use Q, doesn't matter, right? I have a point, right, on the line. Do I know the slope? I know the slope is 0 0.5. Point slope form. So suppose I use P, right? If I use P, so then it's Y minus YP equals the slope of this line times X minus XP. If I use if I use the point Q, of course you can write down as y minus y q equals m p q times x minus x q, right? They will give you the same answer. Okay. Oops, I don't have enough space. Okay, let me move this up a little bit. Okay, now you just plug in numbers, right? Suppose I use a I use a P, okay? So Y minus YP is equal what? Look up the data. YP is equal three. So Y minus three equals uh, MPQ is a 0 0.5, right? And the X minus XP, XP is equal, equal two. So A is the correct answer. Y minus three, half X minus two. If I use Q, then it should be Y minus 3.5 equals 0 0.5 times x minus 3. And if you simplify, these two guys are equivalent. Okay, are equivalent. But I don't have an answer like this in, the, in my choice here, right? So this is a, a, a side note, right? So the slope of the signal line through P and the Q, suppose P and the Q are two points on the curve, y equal of fx. So then of course the y coordinates are fa and fb, right? So then the slope MPQ is FB minus FA, difference of Y coordinates divided by B minus A, difference of X coordinates, right? You need to memorize the formula. So to give an example, <clears throat> now I think we can try this. Okay, so I have a parabola here. Okay, a parabola, Y equal X square is very curve. Um, I want to find the equation of the tangent line to this parabola at one point on the parabola. That point is point P. Coordinates are one and one, right? One square is equal one, so one, one, this point. So how can you write down the equation for this tangent line? 
So what we want to do right now, later on, we, we, we can do this from very easily, okay? Well, after we learn differentiation calculus. But for now, I'm going to estimate this line, okay? I, in order to write down an equation for this line, I already know the point. I just need to, I just need to estimate this slope, right? If I know the slope, then I can write down the equation. So how to estimate the slope? Remember this process here? Right? I can draw a second line. Now that, that a second line, the second point of Q approaches P. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay. <clears throat> so let a Q be another point on a curve. Oh, I think I made a mistake. The first coordinate should be X, second one is X. So say that a Q, that X coordinate, I just call it X. Okay, then the Y coordinates is the F of X, X squared. Right? So x, x squared is a point different from p, from one, one, okay? We are going to let q approach p by letting x approach, approach one. Does it make sense to you? So if x approaches one, then this q approaches point p. So we can compute the slopes of a signal line mpq for different choices of Q points. So that's what I'm gonna do in this table here. So I want to make this Q be close to that P, right? So I want to use the X value, somehow it's close to what? Close to this one here. Does it make sense to you? So for example, this is another point on this curve. Say this point here, this is Q. Then you can draw that signal line, right? Signal line. So this is x and x squared, this point here. I'm going to let this x approach this one, and this q approaches that p, okay? So I do some calculations, okay? Say I use x 0 0.9, it's a little smaller than one, right? So then what is y coordinates x squared, 0 0.81? So what's the q point? 0 0.9, 0 0.81, clear? 0 0.9, 0 0.81, that's the point of q. What's the point of p? Remember, point of p is one, one, right? This is the point of P, right, one, one. Can you compute the slope? So it's a difference of Y coordinates divided by difference of X coordinates. So it's 0 0.81 minus one divided by 0 0.9 minus one, right? So you get a zero, negative 0 0.19 divided by negative 0 0.1, which is 1.9, right? You can compute, okay? I'm going to skip that calculation process, okay? Now I'm going to let x getting cl get closer to one. So how about x equals 0 0.99? Now it's kind of close, right? So you do x square, get y coordinates. So you get the q point, right? Now I have q point, I have p point, I can compute the slope. Trust me, you get this answer here, 1.99. So in this case, my q is at the left of letter P, right? Because X is smaller than one, right? 0 0.9, 0 0.99. How about I use a bigger X, say for 1.1. Now Q is at the right of this point. So if you use 1.1, then Y is 1.21. So I have a Q point, 1.1, 1.21. What's the slope of the second line, PQ? 1.21 minus 1, 0 0.21. 1.1 minus 1, 0 0.1. The ratio is 2.1. So that's the slope of that second line. So again, I'm making this Q even closer. So X equals 1.01 now. You compute Y, X square, you get the Q points, you compute the slope. Now the slope is 2.01. Hmm. So I tried the four second lines, right? And the, all these four second lines, that second point of Q kind of close to letter P, right? So I get these four numbers, 1.9, 1.99. 2.1, 2.01. So what's your guess? If that Q approaches P, this slope of the second line approaches which, which value? What's your guess? Probably which number? Anyone? As Q getting closer and closer to P, the slope of this second line MPQ approaches which number? What's your guess? It's just a guess. Two. Two, yes, that's a two. 
Okay, so I make a guess. As a Q approaches the P, the slope of a signal line approaches this value two. So maybe you can guess the slope of that tangent line as a two. Then you can write down the equation for tangent line. Y minus one equals two times X minus one. Right? Use the point P. Okay. But uh, is this correct? I have to put a question mark, right? Because it's a guess, okay? And uh, in differentiation calculus, we learn how to do, find this slope exactly, okay? Okay, so let's the uh, uh, tangent problem. I call it uh, the skin bump, right? Now let's uh, look at another one, a driving bump, okay? Let's, uh, Look at look at a, a traveling form, a related problem. Okay, a related problem with some physics background. Suppose this is your home. Suppose your home is near a highway, and this is a very straight highway. Right, so you drive away from your home on that straight highway. Okay, so with some velocity. Okay, so then of course you can measure the displacement in physics we call displacement uh, maybe it's easier to understand for now i say the distance right from your car to your home so that a displacement or say that a distance i denote by and denote it by s right say the unit say is mile right so s in miles right is a function of what is a function of your driving time right so time here is denoted by time t the t in hours okay and the velocity of your car is uh, in mile per hour, okay? Now, if your parents drive, right? your parents drive very stably, okay? But it's a little bit boring, right? So the velocity is a constant, let's say, okay? 50 miles per hour. And you can see, you can plot the distance as a function of time, right? S as a function of time, it's just S is equal 50 D, right? 50 D. One hour, 50 miles, two hour, 100 miles, right? So you have a straight line. Right? to describe your distance as a function of t. And the slope of this straight line is just your velocity, right? 50t, see, the slope is 50, that's the velocity. Okay, that's a boring case, right, boring case. Now suppose as a young man, you drive a car, okay? So you drive in an erratic manner, right? So now that displacement is not a linear function of time. So see, this curve, is your the, the distance from your car to your home, right? At t equals zero, zero, right? At home, then you drive, right? So you drive fast, somehow you slow down, then you drive fast again, right? Like, like, like you get this kind of curve here, okay? Now, if I ask you, what's your speed? Or so what's your velocity when time t is equal a here? Now, that's not an easy question. Unlike your parents, you drive your car in an erratic manner, so the speed changes a lot, okay? So we want to find the speed or say the velocity at a particular moment, okay? So that speed or say that velocity at that particular moment in physics is called the instantaneous velocity. So sometimes we say, oh, velocity should be mentioned with regard to a period of time. No, right? Velocity can be mentioned for a particular moment, right? I think you have that experience. If you play the basketball or baseball, right? So when, the, when you catch that ball, at that moment, you can feel the velocity of the ball, right? If the ball is faster, right? Your, your, your hand is hit harder. If the ball is slower at that moment, when you catch the ball, your hand is hit Softener, right? So we do have an instantaneous velocity at that particular moment, t equals a. But how to find it? So again, very similar to that tangent problem. I don't know how to find that instantaneous velocity, but I change my question here. Can you find the average velocity? Between this current instant A and another instant capital T, which is not equal A. That's easy, right? So from moment A to moment capital T, the time duration is T minus A. 
That's the time you drive. How much distance do you cover in this amount of time? Of course, is S the distance at capital T subtract S at A, right? This part here. So your average velocity in that period would be S T minus S A divided by T minus A. My T is capital T, okay? Now, in order to find the instantaneous velocity, the velocity at that particular moment, that particular instant, A, what I can do here is to apply the limiting process. I'm going to let that other instant, that kept T, approach the instant A. See, have the T approaches A. Then we can regard the average velocity between A and the capital T approaches the instantaneous velocity at A, when capital T approaches A. Does that make sense to you? Yes, right? So when that duration, so from that A, it's getting very small, then of course that average velocity is almost like the true velocity at A. So again, you have a limiting process. <clears throat> so, if I ask you, what is the average velocity between instant A and the instant T? If the displacement depends on time T as a function S of T, I think I already told you the answers. I'm not going to launch this whole question here. We know it's S at T subtract S at A, right? So it's this amount subtract this amount gives that a net displacement, right? Divided by the duration T minus A, right? So the answer should be what? The answer should be C, right? S capital T minus S cap, uh, S A divided by T minus A. Okay, that's the incident velocity. So this is the definition, of course, it's, right? So let S G be the displacement, or say the position function. Sometimes we call it the position function, okay? Of an object moving along a straight line at a time t. Okay, that's the position. The average velocity of the object between the time A and the time capital T is computed like this, right? S at capital T minus S at A divided by T minus A. Clear? Now we know as this capital T, this later instant, or say the previous instant, approaches the current instant A, so as the capital T approaches A, this average velocity approaches the instantaneous velocity at instant A. <clears throat> Does that make sense to you? So if this whole thing makes sense to you, I think you will feel easy later on when we do all these uh, definitions about the differentiation and the integration, okay? So this problem, probably some of you already recognize this problem actually is related to that tangent problem. You see that? So when we say the average velocity between A and the capital T, I forgot that is capital T, let me write down capital T here. <clears throat> Uh, hey. Okay, okay. So, right, so then what's the error velocity? We know the difference of this uh, y coordinates divided by the difference of the x coordinates. So that's the average velocity, right? S capital T minus S at A over T minus A. What's that? That's just the slope of what? Of the signal line through PQ. You see that? As capital T approaches this A, then this average velocity approaches the instantaneous velocity. But we know this average velocity is the slope of this signal line. So that instantaneous velocity is the slope of what? Of the tangent line. Clear? So the average velocity is the slope of the signal line through P and Q, these two points, right? That blue line over there. And the instantaneous velocity, we know is the limit of this average velocity, right? As a capital T approaches A. So it's the slope of the tangent line. So it's the slope of that green curve, the green line. So these two problems, the tangent problem 
and the velocity problem, really they are equivalent problems. Okay, equivalent problems. Just in different setting, one in geometry setting, one in physics setting. Okay. So if I want to summarize tangent and velocity problem. So what do we do? We do average, remember? We find the average velocity, we find the average slope, right? We use a tangent signal line. Then we apply the limit process and let a lot of instant approaches the current instance and let that point of Q approach P. So that's the essence of differentiation calculus. Okay, now I think, I, I think you, you can understand these two sentences better. So what is calculus about? It's about instantaneous rate of change, or say the instantaneous velocity about the slope of tangent line. This part here is called a differentiation calculus. It is also about accum accumulation of changing quantities. For example, you have a curl, right? You want to compute the area under that curl. It's accumulation. Uh, that's called a, that part is called an integration calculus. So in both situations, the fundamental, the fundamental process is the limit process. And later on, at the end of this course, you will see differentiation calculus and the integration calculus, they are related by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And they are connected. They are Right now, it looks like a different story, right? One is about the accumulation, one is about that instantaneous moment. But as you will see, we have the fundamental theorem of a calculus to connect differentiation and integration. Okay, so that's uh, <clears throat> a very general preview of a calculus. Okay, we covered some fundamental ideas. Okay, very important for you to get through the essence and so you can. You can then later on, you can just uh, um, work out details. Okay, so always keep this big picture in mind. Okay, uh, so in both situations, right, we need to do that limit process. So now, very naturally, we want to talk about the limit. So let's take a break. Uh, we are going to resume the class at eight o'clock. So uh, you guys can uh, uh, leave your screen and stretch a little bit. And if you have any questions about the previous material, and you can ask me uh, during the break. Okay. Remember, we are going to resume the class at eight o'clock. Any questions? Uh, can you go back to slide slide ten so I can like see the secant line? Okay. <clears throat> this one. You said a uh, slide yeah. ten, right? Yeah. Thank you. The the graph. Yeah, the graph here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just randomly <laughs> uh, pick a point Q on the parabola and draw a sigma line. It's a little bit crowded. Yeah.
Okay, <clears throat> let's resume the class. If you are back to your screen, could you raise your hand? So I know you are back. Do you know how to raise your hand? Okay, good, thank you. And if you don't mind, you can also turn on your web camera. Okay, and if you have some questions in the middle of the lecture, you can uh, turn on your microphone and uh, just ask your questions, okay? Thank you. So please raise your hand if you are back. I'm going to resume the class momentarily. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you can put down your hands now. So let me start. Where are we? Right here, right? The limit process. Okay, so in my preview of a calculus, in both problems, we apply the so-called limit process. Um, <clears throat> so the second part of today's lecture, we are going to take a detailed look at uh, the limit, okay? So now this is a, a third fun activity. I call it a climbing fun, okay? Say so Amber and the board, a girl and the board, right? <clears throat> so they approach a hole on a mountain. So this is a mountain, right? So the height of the mountain is a function of X. The X is the ground position. <clears throat> so at a different X, you have a different height, right? So that red curve is the mountain, Y equals F of X. So there is a hole on this mountain at A, at X equals A, okay, right here. You see that? So Amber and Boyd, right, one at the right, one at the left of that hole. They walk toward that hole, clear? And in this case, because there is a hole at A, so the function f of x is not defined at that hole, okay? f a is not defined in this case. I use an open circle right, on a curve, clear? <clears throat> but we know, so the location of this hole is at x equal a, and the height of this hole corresponding to L, this number L, okay? So as Amber and the boy walk toward that hole, suppose each of them uh, has a, a rope hanging from them, right? So that rope is in this uh, uh, orange color. So that rope indicates indicates the X location of these two, two guys, right? Of these two, two, uh, two keys, okay? So as Amber and the boy walk toward that hole, of course, their X location, right? Approach that value A, clear? Right, that value. Now, so that's, that X is the ground position of these two guys, okay? So now I ask you, as the ground position of Amber or boy X approaches A, their height approach which value? 30 seconds. Did you get the question? Yes. Ten more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So most of you choose the answer B, L. <clears throat> 
Okay, so pay attention to our, our uh, word, our language here. So we say the ground position of amber or boy X approaches A, approaches A. We are not letting X equal to A. It's just to say X is very close to that A. Does it make sense to you? So pay attention to this key word, approach, approach, okay? So if X is equal to A, then that means this boy or this girl steps into that hole, right? That's not what's happening, okay? So as X approaches A, then their height, as you can clearly see, right? So this guy, for example, for a for, for, for boy, right? It's moving down from the right, right? So it's going like this. So the height is getting closer, closer to what value? To that L, right? To that L. And similarly, as Amber is moving up toward that hole, her height is getting closer, closer to what? To this horizontal line, to this L here, to that location, to that hole. Does it make sense to you? So the correct answer is B, L. Some of you choose C, not defined. At this time, I say that's also a good answer, okay? Because you thought, oh, right at A, the height is unknown, right? It's a hole over there, so it's undefined. So probably you thought X somehow equals A, then the height is not defined. So, but I will clarify later, okay? When we take the limit, we let X approach A. When we say approach, we don't let X equals, equal A, okay? So, so I don't blame you if you choose C, okay? But a few of you choose the answer A, probably you read the problem wrong, okay? So I say, their height approaches what, okay? So not their ground position. The ground position X across approaches A, right? But the height approaches uh, this L here, right? So for Boyd, it goes down toward this uh, L. For Amber, it goes up toward this L. Does that make sense to you now? So this problem actually already illustrates the intuitive definition of a limit, okay? So I think it's not that hard to understand intuitively. So here is my definition of a limit, okay? As a mathematician, we don't like this definition, but uh, it's very good for us to understand, okay? To understand the, uh, the, the concept of a limit. And later on, I will, uh, I will, um, I will show you. I will show you the the, the, the rigorous or say the, the precise definition of a limit. Okay, so here is the intuitive definition. Suppose f of x is defined near the number a, x equals a. Now let's make this statement. That means what? f x may or may not defined at x equals a itself, but it is defined when X is close to A. Okay, that's the interpretation, okay? Define a near X equals A. So for example, in this picture here, X at X equals A, this F of X is not defined, you have a hole. But in this case, it's defined, right? So no hole, right? Function defined. But doesn't matter. What I care here is what's going on near that A, okay? So now the function is defined. Now, if we can make f of x, okay, listen carefully. If we can make this f of x, the value of this function, arbitrarily close to the number l by taking x sufficiently close to a. Now go back to that climbing example here, right? Like this. So I can make that height of these two guys as close as L. That means the function, the height is described by the function f of x. I can make the value of f of x as close as possible to this L, after close to this L. If I make this x sufficiently close to A, can you imagine that? I think that you can imagine that, right? So if 
x is very is a sufficiently close to a, then the height of this guy, whatever guy, the void or uh, amber, right, would be very close to that l. And I can make it as close as it wants if my x is sufficiently close to a. Okay. So what's the interpretation of this? That's the picture here, right? So remember, when we say we can take x sufficiently close to a, meaning x approaches a as close as we want, but x is not equal to a. Okay, I think I explained that before. And also when we say x approaches a, x approaches a came from left, right, like this, or from right, right? You see that picture here, right? Either is amber or is a void from left or from right, walk toward this hole, okay? X approaches a. So if x approaches a from left, that means x is less than a, but it's getting closer to a. If x approaches a from right, that means x is bigger than a and x approaches a. Make sense to you? Okay, I'm not done, okay? So if we can make f of x, the value of this function arbitrarily close to L by taking x sufficiently close to A, then we say the limit of f of x as x approaches A equals L. And write this statement as limit L-I-M, the first three letters of that word limit, okay, L-I-M. Limit of f of x, as x approaches a is equal to l. That's the mathematical notation of this statement. But sometimes we just write down f of x approaches l as x approaches a. So that's the intuitive definition of a limit of a function. Does that make sense to you intuitively? Yes. Any questions about this definition? Uh, Daniel asked, why is the not defined? So when we say f x is defined near x equals a, f may or may not be defined at a. Okay, can be defined, cannot be or may not be defined. So we don't care really. When we talk about the limit, where we, it's just like a way I walk toward that hole. I can walk as close as I want, but I'm not going to step into that hole. Keep that in mind. So I don't care what's really going on at that hole, at that A. Okay. So, for example, in this first picture here, is a hole function is not defined at A. But in the second picture here, it is defined at A. Or maybe it's defined at A, but F, F, F A is a value. A, a different location. It doesn't matter. What I care here is when I work on this line here, right, what's going on here? Okay, I don't really step into that x equals a. Keep in mind, okay, x is not equal a. So, so to test your understanding of this intu uh, intuitive definition. So now this is my f of x, right? This is better curve. So f at 1.5 is, is equal to three, right? In this picture here, right, as you can see. So if I ask you, what is the limit of this function f of x as x approaches 1.5? Can you tell me the answer? Anyone? <clears throat> so when x is very close to 1.5, what's the y value of this function approaches? <coughs> Three, thank you. Would it be three, right? So as X approaches 1.5, so really it's like, you, like you consider like you're climbing this mountain or descending this mountain here, right? You are going like toward this, right? At least, right? When X approaches 1.5 from left or from right. So of course, that function value is getting closer and closer to what? To that three over there. Does it make sense to you? At least toward this three here. So limit of fx equals three. So in this case, the function is defined at 1.5 and it's just equals three in this case. Now, how about this case? 
This is my f of x. Now, f at 1.5 is not defined. We have a hole here. What's the limit of f of x as x approaches 1.5? Anyone? Is it still three? Still three, thank you. Yes, as I said, it doesn't, we don't care about what's going on at 1.5. We just care what's, go, what's going on near 1.5. Does that make sense to you? So that's the limit process, the concept of a limit. Okay, so as uh, you approach this hole here, as clearly you see that a function value is getting closer and closer to this three here. So the limit is still three. Now, how about this case? The function value at 1.5 is defined, but the value is equal to one right here. Now, what's the limit of the function f of x as x approaches 1.5? So there are three. No, I think you got it, right? Doesn't matter, right? Is one here or there? Is a pole, when you think this is the mountain here, you have a hole here, you have a pole there, doesn't matter. I just approach that pole, I approach that hole, right? So that as I approach that pole or that hole, how does my height approach, right? A value, that value, the height approach is always this three here. So limit is also three. Has anybody got it? Now, how about this case? This function, right? This is a cliff. Okay, so this mountain has a cliff. So if you go from right, right, you go to like this, then to left, you go like this. So f at 1.5 is defined at this location here, one is equal one. If I ask you, what's the limit of f of x as x approaches 1.5? Does not exist. Does not exist. Thank you. So this one I didn't emphasize before. So if you read my interpretation, when we say x approaches a, x approaches a from what? From both sides, from left and from right, they end up at the same height. Okay, but that's not the case in this case, right? When you approach from left. Somehow you are good, you are getting closer and closer to that three, right? Maybe three kilometers. But if you walk down on this mountain, on this part here, as you as x approaches one point five, you are getting closer and closer to this height, which is one, right? This this value here is one. So you cannot say the limit as x approaches one point five of this f of x is equal to some fixed value because you have different situations. So. In the definition, we need to require, doesn't matter which way you approach it, when you're from both sides, the f has to approach the same value, l, right? Same value, l equals l. So then we say limit f x equals l. So this is called a two-sided limit. When we say x approaches 1.5, we mean from both sides. So this limit is called a two-sided limit. So in this case, this limit does not exist. So sometimes we just write down as uh, does not exist, D and G, okay, D and G, a simple abbreviation like that. Okay, now I think we have a good understanding of the intuitive definition of the limit, okay? So keep in mind approach from both sides, but we never step on that A, okay? So <clears throat> how about this problem here? Which one is the graph of this rational function x squared minus one over x minus one? 30 seconds. Ten seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. <clears throat> the answer is D. Okay, is D. 
Why? Uh, before I move on to this problem here, I think someone asked me, um, let me see. So Angelina, is this clear to you now? You asked me to explain, explain which again? Three, you mean the last one or, or the, the third one, this one, right? You can turn on your microphone, okay? If you, you want, if you, if you want to ask a question, because sometimes I don't check the chat uh, very often. So in this case, the limit is still three. Why? Because as I said, right, we're just concerned about uh, the, the value of this function f of x as x approaches 1.5, but we don't let x equal 1.5. So when you when you move, it's just like you climb a mountain. Like for example, if you are here, right, you climb this mountain like this, right? So you getting close and closer to this hole, you can, as close as you want. One millimeter, one micrometer, one nanometer, okay. But you don't step into that hole. So then what's your height? Your height is, so is it getting closer to what? To that three, does it make sense to you? Doesn't matter what, what's going on right at 1.5. Is defined, undefined, or is one is here? Doesn't matter, right? So you're at, at, in this limiting process, as you walk toward that, Whole or say at x approaches 1.5, the function value approaches the three. So limit is equal to three, right? In this side or in that side, doesn't matter. Is this clear to you now? Okay. Now, so this one, the answer should be D. Why? I think a little bit of algebra, right? So it's a rational function x squared minus one. We know x squared minus one is x squared minus one scale, same, right? And x square minus one square difference of square is x plus one times x minus one. You can factorize it like this over x minus one. So this rational function is not defined at x equals one, right? Otherwise it divided by zero. If, so not defined at one. But if x is not equal one, then x minus one is non-zero. You can cancel x minus one now. So is equal what? Just x plus one. So the graph of this function is the same as x plus one, as long as x is not equal to one. So we know the graph of x plus one is this red curve. But the answer shouldn't be A. Why? Because that's the way fx equals x plus one only for x not equal to one. If x is equal to one, then we know this function is not defined, right? So the domain does not include that one. So then you have a hole at one. Away from that hole, the function is just what? X plus one, clear? So the difference of this f of x and x plus one is that of one point. X plus one, no holes. This function here, has a hole at x equal one, clear? So if you understand that, now if I ask you, what's the limit of this function x squared minus one over x minus one as x approaches one? Anyone tell me, tell me. Two. It's two, right? So now you see the limit it should be two, even though this guy is not defined at one, but as I said, it never step into that hole, right? You don't, you don't care about what's going on at x equals one. I just approach one. So then, of course, as you can see, as x approaches one, the value of the function approaches two here, right? Two. So this limit is equal to two. So this is the solving process that I already explained, right? So keep in mind this f of x not defined at x equals one, but defined near x equals one, okay? As x approaches one, Remember, x is not equal to one. It's just getting closer and closer to one. So if x is not equal to one, then x minus one is non-zero. So you can cancel x minus one, right? You can cancel x minus one, non-zero factor. So fx is just the same as x plus one. So when x is not equal to one, fx is the same as x plus one. So the limit of this function, of course, then you see, 
as x approaches one would be the same as the limit of x plus one as x approaches one, which is equal to clear. <clears throat> Okay, so so far, okay, those examples, most of them, right, the limits exist. Of course, this first one, the limit does not exist. So, so well, so how do you know if a limit exists or not? So sometimes it's not an easy question. Okay, so take a look at this example here. <clears throat> Say limit of sine x over x as x approaches zero. This is interesting. Why? As x approaches zero, what's the numerator? Numerator of this fraction here is sine x. And we know if x approaches zero, sine x approaches what? Approaches zero. Okay. Can you see my web, web browser? Can you see the graph? Yes, okay. See, this is the graph of sine x, right? Wave, right? So this is x, and this is a zero here, right? So as x approaches zero, clearly you see sine x approaches what? Approaches zero, right? Approaches zero, that's clear, okay? That's clear. Now, the denominator is just x. So if I say x approaches zero, that means the denominator also approaches zero. So, this quotient here, as x approaches zero, it approaches zero divided by zero. What's that? Right? And uh, <clears throat> so to find out this limit, right now we don't have any tool to find the limit, but right? we just don't understand the definition, right? an intuitive definition, right? So how to compute this limit, right? Later on in the next class, I will show you a lot of skills to, to find the limit. But for now, I don't have those available. So we only have this, uh, I mean, if you give me a graph, probably I can look at that graph and tell you, oh, the limit exists and it is equal to this, right? But uh, if I give this expression here, how do you know the limit? I don't know. Uh, before I do that, let me draw the graph of this function and you got to give you the guess. Y equals now is sine of x over x. The blue curve is the graph of sine x over x. So as x approaches zero, zero is the origin is right here, right? So, so what's the value here? Another value, let me add here. There's a green dot here. Do you see that green dot? So let me zoom, zoom this a little bit, right? So now can you tell me, based on the graph, if I say, as x approaches zero, sine x over x approaches what? Look at that blue curve. What's your guess? Approaches one. Approaches one. one. Yes. Approaches one, right? See here. Right? Getting closer to this guy here. But that's kind of interesting, right? Zero over zero somehow approaches one. <clears throat> and so here I'm just going to do a I do some calculations, okay, to convince you that, right? Fx over is sine x over x. We know this function is an even function, right? If you replace x by negative x, sine negative x over negative x is f of negative x. And then we know sine negative x is equal to negative sine x. And negative sine x over negative x is sine x over x, which is the f of x. So this function is odd, uh, sorry, is even, right? I think the graph shows you that, right? So if you look at the graph, it's symmetric about the y-axis. So it's an even function, right? And uh, <clears throat> so, so from now I wanna, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, uh, okay, use my calculator and compute something. So, so you say, oh, I'm going to let x get smaller and smaller. So of course, it doesn't matter. It's point one or negative point zero one or negative zero point one because function is even, so same value, right? So I'm going to use 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and 0 0.001, and compute this ratio here and see what I get, okay? So convince you that. Can you see my calculator? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. So 0 0.1, I do sine of latch, then I divide it by 0 0.1. I got a 0 0.998. Okay. Now I make my x even smaller. 
0 0.01. So it's 0 0.01 sine of let in radians. Okay, in radians. Okay, sine this. Then divided by 0 0.01. What did I get? I get a 0 0.99998. You see that? How about a 0 0.00001? That's a very small x now, right? I do sine of that. Then I divide it by, I forget what I have, right? It's 0 0.00000. See, I think my calculator cannot handle um, long digits. So it is a wrong set of value to one, but it's not exactly equal one, okay? It should be something so close to one. So my calculator just show me, choose me one. So probably you're convinced the limit of sine x over x as x approaches zero is equal to one. Okay, I think I already showed you the graph, right? Sine x. So what does that mean? That means, so if you look at, if you go back to that software, so if I plot, I plot a graph of sine x, this is sine x like this, right? If I plot a graph of y equal x, so that's sine x is the numerator, x is the denominator. So what do you see here? So when x is close to zero, so these two curves, they're very close to each other. Right? Somehow they approach zero in the same rate. So that's why the ratio somehow is equal one. Does it make sense to you? So if you zoom, 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 you can, when you zoom enough, you cannot see the difference between these two functions near zero. Actually in physics, some people use x to approximate sine x when x is small. Okay, so of course we don't have any techniques to, to find this thing, but based on those graphs and the calculations, somehow we are convinced limit of sine x over x is equal to one. This is the fact, I want you to memorize it. This is true, okay, this is true. So as x approaches zero, sine x approaches zero with the same speed as x approaches zero. So that's why this ratio is equal to one. Okay, so this is a very important limit. And in the next class, I'm going to prove it. Okay. Now, how about this guy? How about the limit of sine one over x? Let me ask you, does this function, <clears throat> is this function defined at x equals zero? Yes or no? Is this function sine one over x defined at x equals zero? No, because it's one divided by zero. One divided by zero, right? You cannot divide by zero. So this function is not defined at zero. But if x is not equal to zero, is this function defined? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, right? Then we know if x is non-zero, then one over x is some number, right? Sign, we know the domain of sign is all the real numbers, that right? is defined. So in this case, this function is not defined at x equals zero, we know that. However, when we compute the limit, we don't let x equal zero, right, remember? So maybe this limit exists, right? Because we don't care what, what, what's going on at zero, okay? We don't care that. We just say what's going on near zero. We care that. Okay, so do you think that limit exists? So let me show you the graph of this function. This function is very weird, right? As you can clearly see. So by the way, this uh, uh, this software is very very useful, right? It's called a uh, uh, decimals.com slash calculator. You may want to write it down, right? Later on, if you want to check the graph or something, you can, you can use this uh, web uh, uh, software. So it's y equals sine of one over x. That's the graph here. See, we know sine, right? Oscillates between next one and one. That's what you see here, right? Next one. When x is very large, when x is very large, one over x is almost zero. 
So now you get a zero, right? So you have these horizontal asymptotes, right? Which is the x-axis. So if you zoom, 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 zoom. Do you see that? Right? So it's almost zero, right? When x is large enough. But when x is getting smaller and smaller toward zero, so there you can clearly say, for example, when x is equal to 0 0.01, is 1 over 0 0.01, you get 100. When you get a 0 0.02, that is one over that is uh, uh, fifty, right? So, so then you know that argument of size actually changes very dramatically. So, so you see that very rapid oscillation, right? When x is small, do you see that? So, what do you think? Do you think the limit exists? The limit in this case does not exist does not exist, okay? This is the fact. You can imagine, for example, so one over X, suppose X is very small, say, oh, X is equal to 10 power negative 10. So that is a sign 10 power 10. You get some value. But then I change X a little bit, then suddenly sign becomes a different value. So it's also this very crazy, okay? We cannot have a limit here, okay? At X, as X approaches zero. So this limit does not exist. Now I have a, challenging problem here. What's the limit of x times sine one over x? Again, this function here is not defined at x equals zero, right? Because you have one over x. But do you think this case, in this, in this case, when you multiply the x in front, do you think this limit exists? Give it a guess. We will have a tool to, to analyze this later, but I, now I just want you to build this intuitive understanding. <clears throat> 30 seconds. I will see how many of you got it right. Okay. Okay, um, let's take a look. Oh, I don't blame you if you choose the wrong answer, but a correct answer should be A. I think most of you actually more than 50% got it right. Very good, okay. The limit in this case exists and is equal to zero, is equal to zero. Why? Okay. <clears throat> We cannot prove it, right? But we can, we can, we can have an intuitive understanding. So x approaches zero. For example, I use an x value equal, how about 10 power negative 10? That's a small, right? What do I get? That is a 10 power negative 10 times the sine of the reciprocal of that. That's a 10 power 10. How about this value here? Keep in mind, this sign, whatever sign, right? This guy is always between what? Between next one and one. Cannot be bigger than one. Cannot be smaller than next one. So the magnitude of this value here should be what? Should be very small, right? Is it 10 power negative 10, maybe times 0 0.5, maybe times negative 0 0.3, whatever. But it's a small value, right? Can you make it, can you make it as small as you want? How about this? X equal 10 power negative 2021. Now it's so small, right? 2021, zero point, then we have 2021 zeros, then you have one, right? So what's the value you have? 10 power negative 2021, this is my X. And then sine of X, one over X should be equal what? Equal sine of the reciprocal, this is just a positive power, right? Like this. I don't care this one. What's the value of this? I don't know. But, uh, but uh, my point here is this thing here is between what? Between one and the negative one. Make sense to you? So you multiply this is very small value by something, not big. Still, this guy is uh, even smaller. And you can go on and on. Imagine as X approaches zero, this limit should be for what? 
is a zero. Does that make sense to you now? Well, if you don't believe it, right, let me show the graph. So I mark this thing by X. Now it's different now, see? You see that? The graph looks not always like this, right? Even though the author is crazy, but as X approaches zero, somehow you shrink to this point, that of origin over there. Because you multiply by X. Max. Okay. So uh, at this point, right, if you don't get it, that's okay. It's just some intuitive understanding of the behavior of a function near A. Okay. And in the next class, we're going to learn laws and the techniques to compute limits. Okay. So let's move on to something else. Okay. Related but different. Any questions? So previously, right, we define a limit intuitively, and we say x approaches a. When we say that, it means x approaches a from both left and right, from both sides. But sometimes we are interested in the behavior of this function when x approaches a from just one side. So in this case, we have a so-called one-sided limits. Okay, say so this is the number line. A is right here. Okay, so if X approaches A from left, so X is getting closer and closer to A, but X should be less than A, right? Because it's from left. So then we can write X approaches A minor. So this notation here, X approaches A minor, this notation means X approaches A from left, okay? Minor means it's smaller than A, okay? Minor means X less than A. So if we let X approach the A only from right, so X is bigger than A, but it's getting closer and closer to A, then we write X approaches A plus. So now we can define the so-called the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. So limit of a function f of x as x approaches a minor. Keep in mind, a minor means from left, so it's smaller than a. Right? So for example, look at this picture here. This is the graph of f of x. I think we saw similar graph before. If I ask you, what's the limit of f of x as x approaches two minor? What's your answer? Three. Can you speak louder? Three. Three. Three, yes. Is, oh, sorry, let me change my pen. So it should be what? Should be three, right? So, so basically, I mean, I'm working on this mountain only on one, one side, right? From this side here, right? Toward this, this hole, right? X approaches two in this manner. So of course, then my height is getting closer and closer to this three here, right? I don't care what's going on right at A. I don't care what's going on at the right of A. I only care what's going on to the left of A when you compute the left-hand limit. Does that make sense to you? So of course, the limit is three. So what's going on here, irrelevant, okay, irrelevant. And similarly, the right hand limit, we let X approach A from right. I think my picture is copied, so I didn't <laughs> change this. This should be changed to a different way. Okay. Let me fix that. Okay. You, can, you can fix your notes, okay? As if, if you already printed out, so the arrow should be drawn here, right like this, right? So as X approaches two from right, two plus, right? So then you work on that mountain, on this portion here, right? Toward this hole. So what's the limit in this case? Two. And should it be two, right? Should it be two, right? It's getting closer, closer to this value here, right? This value here, two. Well, I think you got it, right? So the previous definition is called a two-sided limit, right? I already mentioned that, right? So the two-sided limit and the one-sided limit somehow they are connected, as you can clearly see. Look at this graph. Limit of f of x as x approaches two minor 
is a three. From uh, approach two plus is a two. So what's the limit of fx at x approach two? So does not exist, right? Because you don't have a, so when, when we say x approach two is from both sides, then you get the same value, right? So immediately we have this theorem here. So if we say limit of f of x is equal L as x approaches A, meaning x approaches A from both sides, right? This is true if and only if we say equivalent to say the left hand limit and the right hand limit both are equals to L. Does that make sense to you? So only when both when you approach from left, you get L. You approach from you approach A from right, you also get L. Then we say limit at x approach A is L and vice versa. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's easy to understand. Now a quick poll question. This function is also very important in application. It's called a heavy side function, sometimes called a step function. So it's a piecewise function defined in this manner. So if so it's called h of x, right? And the first letter of a heavy side. So if x is less than zero, the function value is always zero. If x is bigger than zero, the function value is always equal one. So this is, you can consider this like a switch, right? You have a switch. So your light bulb before you turn on a switch is zero, is off. So switch on, you turn it on at the moment zero, then it stays on. So then it's one like that. So I ask you, what's the limit of this heap set of function as x approaches zero plus 30 seconds? Okay, let's take a look. I think most of you got it right, right? The answer should be B. Can you sketch the graph of this function? I think you can, right? So what's the graph of this function? Right. I have this coordinate, coordinate system. So this function h of x is equal zero when x is less than zero. So it's a horizontal, right? It's on the x axis, zero, 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 okay? For all these x values. When x is equal, is bigger than zero, then it's equal what? Equal one. And like this, right? So this value here is one. So this is the graph of the, here we set a function, h of x, piecewise function. So it's like a cliff here, right? Like a step, right? Like a step. So when we say x approach zero plus, so this is called a right side limit. So x approach zero from right. right? So you're working on this portion right, towards this hole here. So of course, the value of your function approaches one. So the answer is one. Okay. Um, if I ask you, what's the limit of this function h of x as x approaches a zero minor? Anyone? Zero. Zero, right? Then you work this way, right? So you approach this value here. How about the limit of h of x as x approaches zero? Does not Does exist. Not exist. Not exist now, right? Because the left and right limits do not match. Okay. <clears throat> and finally, um, let's take a look at the infinite limits. Okay, infinite limits. So in algebra and in pre calculus, right, you learned about vertical asymptotes, right? Asympto. Asymptotes, asymptotes. 
equals. I think my <laughs> spelling is wrong here. S input, S input two. Speak like this, S input two. As as. Okay, so what is that? So say this function here, f of x. So as this, uh, this vertical line is x equals a, right? So x is equal to this vertical line. It's not a function, okay? This is not a graph of a function, right? This is just a vertical line. And uh, suppose the graph of this f of x behaves like this. So as <clears throat> x getting closer and closer to a, the value of the function is getting bigger and bigger towards positive infinity. So if that's the case, they say limit of f of x <clears throat> as x approaches a minus. So in this case, it's a minus from left, right? Is equal to post infinity, so right down like this. So it's called an infinite limit. Okay? And similarly, so if uh, the graph of this function behaves like this, right, in this picture here, so as x approaches a from right, right x approaches a plus, the value of the function approaches positive infinity. It's getting bigger and bigger, right? It's rising like this and getting closer to. So it's getting closer and closer to this vertical line, right? This vertical line, like that. Then we say that the right-hand limit of f of x as x approaches a plus is a positive infinity, okay? And this x equals a, this is a vertical line is called a vertical asymptote for this function because of the curve of this function is getting closer and closer to this vertical line. Right? So asymptote means, means getting closer and closer. <clears throat> and similarly, I think that this is very similar stuff, right? So if X approaches A from left and the function value of F of X approaches negative infinity, then we say limit of f of x as x approaches a minor is equal to negative infinity. Okay, so again, x equals a, this vertical line is a vertical asymptote. And uh, similarly, right? So if you let x approach a from right and the function f of x approaches negative infinity, then we write down this, right? The right limit of f of x is equal to negative infinity. Again, this is a, a vertical asymptote. So rows are one-sided limits. And sometimes a function may behave like this. So you can approach A from either left-hand side or from right-hand side. But in both situations, the value of this function go up toward post infinity. Then we can simply say limit of f of x as x approaches A is post infinity. Or in this case, right, either from left or from right, the value of the function approaches negative infinity. Then we say the limit of fx as x opposed to a is negative infinity. So these two graphs are for two-sided limit. So what, what, what do you think if a function looks like this? Suppose, Suppose, so this x equals a is right here. Right? So that graph function looks like this. Shoots up at the left hand side and it shoots down at the right hand side of this x equals a. This is a graph of f of x. So if this is the case, if I ask you, what's the limit of f of x as x approaches a minor. Anyone? Positive infinity. Positive infinity, right? Positive infinity. And the limit of f of x as x approaches a plus is equal what? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. How about the limit of f of x as x approaches a? Uh, it doesn't exist. Does not exist now, right? Because even the behavior, right? Like that. Okay. So this kind of thing uh, happens for rational functions. So let us take a look at some special rational functions. Say one over x minus a power n, right? This is a rational function, right? The numerator is just the constant, the fun constant polynomial one. The denominator is x minus a power n. 
So what happens as x approaches a? Of course, we know this function is not is not defined at x equals a, right? Because you don't want to divide by zero. Zero power n is just zero. <clears throat> However, as x approaches a near a, right? F of x is defined. And what's the behavior of this function? It depends on the parity of this a, right? A is odd or is it even. So let's take a look. If a is odd, right? odd, say for example, you can think about x minus a power one. That's easy to you to understand, right? X minus a power one, x minus a power three, something like that. X minus a power one is then one over x minus a. We know one over x minus a, the graph looks like this. So it's called a hyperbola, right? Like this, right? So x equals a is not defined. However, if x is bigger than a, x minus a is what? So if x is bigger than a, x minus a is a positive, right? It's a positive. Then x minus a power n is positive. So as x approaches a from right, so this x minus a approaches zero, but it's a positive. So it's a positive number, but it's getting smaller and smaller. Of course, the function shoots up toward a positive infinity. Clear? If x, listen carefully, if x is less than a, so as x approaches a from left, so x is less than a, then x minus a is negative. So you have a negative power or the number. That's still negative, right? So then, as this negative number getting smaller and smaller, you divide by a smaller and a smaller number, but it's negative. So of course, the function goes to negative infinity. Right? Think of this example here, fx equals one over x minus a, which is x minus a power one, right? Power one. Clear? However, if this n is even, then what happens? Because the even power is always non-negative. So if x is bigger than a, you have even power, for example, square, right? Square or positive number, of course, positive. But if x is less than a, x minus is negative, you do square, square of a negative number, still positive. So in this case, as you can see, as x approaches a, it doesn't matter from left or from right, right? So the function value approaches the positive infinity because the one over a positive is a small number, right? Like that. Does that make sense to you? So you can think of one over x minus a square right, to understand this behavior. So if you understand, now let me ask you this question here. What's the limit of n over square root of one minus v square over c square if v approach the c minor? By the way, this equation is uh, from uh, Einstein's relativity theory, right? It's a mass of uh, objects with the velocity v, right? So it turns out if the velocity is getting, so the velocity should be less than the speed of light, uh, c is the speed of light. Okay, so if the velocity is less than the speed of light, the, the true ma mass of this, this m is uh, the mass of the object when v is, the mass when the v is zero, so the, when the object is static. So as the, v, the, as the velocity increases, the, the mass of this object actually is decreasing, uh, is, is increasing, okay, it's increasing. That's a, from the Einstein's relativity theory. So now I have this question here. What happens if this V, the, the velocity of this object is approaching the speed of light from left? And we know we cannot exceed the speed of light, right? So what's the mass of the object as the velocity is getting closer and closer to the speed of light? Can you figure that out? The last uh, poll question for the day. And uh, I'll give you one minute to think about this problem.
10 more seconds. Okay. The answer is B. Okay, the answer is B. Why? This is a, a little bit challenging problem here, okay? Any questions here? Let me just check. Positive infinity, yes. Why is a positive infinity? So first you know, square roots, right? So it gives you a positive number, right? M is a mass, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a positive, right? So it should be positive infinity. Why is the positive infinity? So, um, so V approach C minor, meaning what? V is less than C, but V is getting closer to C, right? Like that. So if V is less than C, V square over C square should be less than one, right? Less than one, right? C is bigger than V, right? So this one minus V square over C square, this part here should be positive. So it's a square root of a positive number. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense right? in physics. Okay. So is m over square root of a positive number? But what is that a positive number? That a positive number is one over v square over c square. If v is getting closer and closer to c, then we know what v square over c square is getting closer closer to one. So this positive number is getting smaller and smaller, right? It's one minus one, right? It's zero. So then you take a square root, it's still a positive value, and but it's also approach zero. So m over a very small positive number gives you positive infinity. And if you don't understand this problem here, it's okay. We are going to learn uh, limit laws and the uh, uh, techniques for computing uh, limits in the next class. Okay, so that's all for today's lecture, right? We gave a preview of what a calculus is about, right? By looking at the two kinds of problems, right? An error problem and the velocity or tangent problem, right? So we have differentiation calculus and the integration calculus, right? With uh, the concept of the limit. Then we talk about intuitive definition of uh, limits of functions. Okay, that's all. And uh, if you have any questions, you can remain and ask me, otherwise you can leave. And I will see you, see you, um, see you which day? Friday, right? On Friday. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Question. Yes. Uh, so.